Welcome, everyone. Good evening. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow here at the SEPA Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia, and I am thrilled to be here to kick off this book launch for Richard Nephew's new book, The Art of Sanctions, A View from the Field. Um, Richard is, is a remarkable colleague. Um, uh, he, his, his, he's been prolific um, in the past few years writing on Iran, Russia, Venezuela, and much more. Um, before he was here at the SEPA Center on Global Energy Policy, he advised the U.S. President and Secretary of State on exactly the topics that he's writing about in this book, which we're going to hear about. He, this book, which I highly recommend um, you get and um, buy as copies for Christmas presents for all your friends and relatives, <laughs> Uh, there is no better stocking stuffer than this book. Um, it's really an example of the type of academic rigor and excellence that, that we are aiming to bring to the issues of energy and public policy uh, broadly here at, the, here at Columbia in the Center on Global Energy Policy. This is the second in a book series um, that we are um, sponsoring. The first was by our colleague Bob McNally uh, called Crude Volatility. Um, and then next month, we're releasing one called The Fracking Debate by Daniel Raimi from the University of Michigan, which looks at the issue the title suggests. Future books are underway on um, Russia's energy landscape, Iraq's energy future. I'm writing one on the future of the electric grid, and much more. So t we have a fantastic panel today. I'm going to turn it over to the moderator in a minute. Um, uh, like all of our events, this is being broadcast live. Thank you for those who are, are joining remotely. Um, a full video and podcast will be available. Um, and uh, if you're watching online, you can ask questions too. Um, use our hashtag CGEP events. And please follow us on Twitter at Columbia U Energy um, is our handle. So with that, I'm, I'm delighted to turn it over to Ed Crooks. If, if you follow energy, Ed needs no introduction. He's the Financial Times uh, chief energy correspondent in the United States. Um, a distinguished uh, journalistic career. He was an economics correspondent um, uh, and editor before he covered energy, both with FT and the BBC. He's a graduate of Oxford. If you haven't already signed up for Ed's newsletter, do it. It's the best uh, weekly source on, on energy I know of. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Crooks of the Financial Times. Thanks very much indeed, David. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you very much to the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy for inviting me here to chair what I think will be a fascinating debate. And it's been a great pleasure to get a chance to read this excellent book, The Art of Sanctions, um, before coming here. Um, as I'll, I'll introduce the panel in just a moment. As David was saying, just uh, first of all, be aware that we are recording, um, and it's also we are broadcasting this um, around the world to anyone who wants to tune in, so you should just be aware of that. And just to reiterate uh, David's point, it would be great if people who are watching um, online did want to ask questions, and please do that with the hashtag CGEP events and the Twitter handle at ColumbiaUEnergy. So, um, as David was saying, um, our first uh, speaker will be Richard Nephew, who's going to talk about this book, The Art of Sanctions. He's a senior research scholar here at the Centre on Global Energy Policy, uh, the centre which he joined in February 2015, directly from his role as Principal Deputy Coordinator for Sanctions Policy at the Department of State, and he held that position for a couple of years since February 2013. Um, Richard also served as the lead sanctions expert for the US team negotiating with Iran, and from May 2011 to January 2013, he was the Director of Iran on the National Security Staff, and earlier in his career, he served at the Departments of State and Energy, working on nuclear non-proliferation. Um, to his left, we have Jacqueline Shah, who served from 2010 to 2014 as the US member of the UN Panel of Experts on Iran and Sanctions, advising the UN Security Council on effective implementation of Iran-related sanctions by UN member states and investigating reported cases of non-compliance by Iran. She also currently works in sanctions compliance for a financial institution. And last, but by no means least, you may have noticed um, a change to our published program, as they say. Unfortunately, um, uh, Zhu Takeda, Takeda was uh, unable to be with us tonight. Um, uh, international events have unfortunately uh, detained him, but we're very pleased to be able to welcome uh, an excellent replacement in the shape of Dr. Tim Bursman, who's a senior research scholar at the Centre on Global Energy Policy. Prior to joining CGEP, he was a fellow and acting director of the Energy Security and Climate Initiative at the Brookings Institution from 2011 to 2012. He was Transatlantic Academy Fellow in 
Washington, D.C. And before starting his career in research, he spent five years in the private sector, working as a corporate counsel to the electric electricity production sector in the Netherlands. Um, and Tim Bursma holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Groningen. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Um, so Richard, perhaps um, uh, first thing I have to say again, congratulations on the book. Really. Um, Fascinating bit of work. I, I very much enjoyed it. It um, will be great to talk about it, but I think you're going to uh, start off by talking a little bit about some of your conclusions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much to everybody who, who joined uh, us here. Thanks very much to Ed, Jackie, and Tim uh, for joining me up here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, a book that I've wanted to write for quite some time. Um, and it is the summary of a lot of thoughts and discussions and conversations and debates that uh, I participated in while uh, in the U.S. government and then uh, subsequent to that uh, when I left in uh, January of 2015. And this is in, in part because uh, while I was in government, I, I often felt that we were flying blind. Uh, not that we didn't have a strategy about what we were trying to do with regard to a particular country. Um, but it was all very nascent. We knew we wanted to get a resolution of the nuclear issue with Iran, and we knew we had sanctions to, to uh, try and apply leverage, so you kind of combine the two things and success uh, emerges from that. Um, obviously, that's not the way in which uh, you're able to actually execute a strategy. A lot more is required uh, than that. But there wasn't a convenient framework for how to think about implementation of sanctions, how to start off with a set of questions about uh, a, a given target and what its policies were, what it was doing that was a problem that you wanted to address, and how to go from that realization, that, uh, that, that, that identification of an issue, and, and move into an actual uh, process where you can get to a solution. And so, uh, more often than not, I often felt that, that uh, sanctions were, were chosen less as an instrument of last resort than as an instrument of get me some kind of resort, uh, without a whole lot of consideration about what we need to do and how, and how to orchestrate actual success. And, and this doesn't mean that they were necessarily the, the tool of desperation, but they were close to it. Uh, they were a, a tool that you picked on when you couldn't really think uh, of anything else to do. And um, I, I think from that perspective, uh, I, I wanted to try and lay out some sense for how we might uh, do things uh, better. That's especially the case considering that we've over the last 15 years or so seen a change in even how sanctions are, are considered. 15 years ago when uh, we first started looking at, at sanctions with regard to Iran, they were seen as a loser approach, you know, something that was never going to work. And in fact, I had a superior who said, these are never going to work, you're wasting your time, which was a great motivator uh, to show up for work. Uh, now we actually have the opposite and I, I think equally problematic situation uh, in which sanctions are seen as a solution to everything. If you have a problem, break the glass and solution will come out, it's sanctions, and then that put that in a box and shake it and we have a solution to a problem. That's also not the case. And, and I think um, the, the fact that we have drifted between sanctions can never achieve something to sanctions can achieve everything uh, is, is equally foolish and equally uh, problematic. So the result is this book. Um, when I started writing it, uh, I, I began with consideration of a concept that I think is central to sanctions, but it's hard to, to talk about in polite company, which is pain. Sanctions are intended to cause pain. They simply are. That's a reality. Um, but we use a lot of words like consequences and measures, and we try and talk around the idea uh, that is central to sanctions, which is pain, in order to make something a little bit more diplomatically palatable. But the idea, at the end of the day, is that we're trying to impose pain on those who are doing things we don't like so that they stop. But the question then becomes, to what end? for what reason and for how long. And so to address those questions, I began to consider how I would approach the design of a new sanctions regime if I had a blank sheet of paper. If a boss came in with a country that we had no uh, uh, previous experience with sanctions, uh, but said we need to do something to address this problem. And I, and I said, okay, how would you start with this? Well, you'd start by first identifying your objectives. What is it that you wish to obtain? What's your bottom line? What's your goal? And this is actually harder than it might sound because an objective is not necessarily the same thing as what do I really, really want. It can be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And that's where a little bit of discrimination actually needs to come in. What do I think I can get from the other side that will make me happy? 
So let me give you an example of this. I might be really happy if we got regime change in Iran. It might solve a whole host of problems with respect to the Iranians, whether it's dealing with things like terrorism, uh, nuclear weapons proliferation, missiles, human rights, or so forth. But is that necessarily my objective? And I think in many cases where you might come to the answer is, no, this isn't the only thing that's potentially going to solve the problems that I've identified with respect to the Iranians. The answer might be yes, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And so identifying what are your bottom lines, what are the things you absolutely must have, what is the thing that if you don't solve this particular problem, you might not have even bothered, is the first step. What is your actual baseline objective? What do you really need to have? Because you need to get to the second level of the framework, which is an assessment of the sanctions target. Sanctioners have to get to grips with the fact that they're not merely imposing measures on a crash test dummy and trying to see how measures are going to work. You're imposing sanctions on a target that will have its own sense of purpose, its own instincts, its history, culture, and security interests. And so you have to come to grips with the fact, as I write in the book, that there is another issue, another idea and concept here, which is resolve. And it's resolve on the part of the sanction to keep doing what they're doing and to respond accordingly. We have to remember the fact that there is a reason why the target you're imposing sanctions upon started doing the thing that they were doing in the first place. It didn't necessarily come out of thin air. There were underlying reasons and security rationale, potentially a political rationale, economic rationale, that pushed them to take the sorts of steps that they were taking. And presumably, those concepts, those issues, those, those uh, objectives of their own have got some degree of value. So you need to start off by evaluating how important is continued persistence with this strategy to your target? Is it something that's vital? Is it something that's meaningless? More often than that, I think it's probably someplace in between. And so from that perspective, it's not likely that you're going to have a single sanction be imposed and immediately have success. You're going to have an iterative process in which your target reacts to the things that you do to keep pursuing that original policy that interested in the first place. And so, the third step, really, of the framework is you have to lay out a strategy in which you build in resistance. You build in that it, your activities are going to be incremental, that this is a multi-play game, and that you're going to need to be responsive to what actually develops and transpires and uh, what you see evolving on the ground. And this relates very closely to my fourth level and fourth element of the framework, which is monitoring and calibration. In sanctions, you have to see what works and what doesn't, what's effective and what's less so. And you have to be prepared to walk away from something that is proving to be a waste of time. Because you don't have a unlimited store of sanctions, effort, tools, pressure, ability to talk to foreign countries and foreign banks and foreign partners to get them to do the things that you wish. You've got a number of competing priorities. And so you have to husband your resources very carefully and you have to make sure that you are uh, checking against what your long-term uh, interests are as well as what seems to be actually having an effect. Importantly, you also have to understand how your target is seeing things, how they're seeing the situation develop. Are they comfortable? Are they nervous? Are they too nervous? Are they perceiving the situation that's one where there is nothing that they could possibly do to get out from under the sanctions? And so there's no point in even trying to uh, respond. And this is the fifth level of the framework, and I think actually it's the most important of all. Laying out a set of criteria for the sanctions target that establishes what they have to do for sanctions to be removed. Making sure that they understand that there are things that they can do that are within their power that can reverse the situation. Because without that, <clears throat> there is really no reason for your sanctions target to respond as the way you wish to. But most important, you haven't laid out a concept of success for even yourself. Because it's in here that you can do a lot of the hard work of trying to establish from your own policies and your own procedures whether or not there are certain things that are acceptable solutions to the underlying problem and things uh, that are not. And this is much harder than it sounds. First of all, not all parties to the sanctions might agree. You might find if you've got a multinational set of sanctions that have been imposed that some countries are accepting something that's far less than what other countries are willing to accept. This happened during the Iran talks. I think it's happened in a number of other circumstances in which the country that is potentially uh, most interested in a outcome 
and won at really any expense, might be willing to, wait, to trade away sanctions leverage in order to get any kind of outcome, whereas other countries, other participants might have much higher bars. And if you don't have a common sense of exactly what you need to see and how you need to achieve success, you make it much more difficult to get to one. Second, not all the constituents with even one party might agree. Again, I think the Iran example is a good example of this, but you might also look at Russia, and you might look at Iraq in the 1990s as an example as well, where there was a divergence in view as to what would be a satisfactory outcome to the problem that was being uh, pursued even within a country. And I think one of the reasons why the Iran debate was uh, as uh, rancorous as it was in 2015 uh, comes a lot from the fact that there was a honest to goodness dispute between various different uh, advocates of, of policy towards Iran about what was a good enough solution uh, to the problem. And of course, then you have to confront the sixth level of the framework, which is a constant evaluation of maybe this isn't going to work at all. A willingness to look at the policy and the sanction strategy you've laid out and to consider whether or not an alternative situation, an alternative solution is more effective. And to decide that in fact, uh, even though you've been pursuing a sanction strategy with uh, a great deal of vigor, even though you've been committed to it, even though you've done a lot of effort in support of it, at the end of the day, you are not likely to achieve success if you continue. And having an element of your, uh, uh, your, your laid out framework in which you establish in advance we might have to think about this again. To me, is both an important element of truth telling. To you. So that way you understand what you are going to be able to achieve and what you're not going to be able to achieve. But it's also important so that way you don't continue to engage in policies without any real chance of success. All right, so that may all be a bit logical and that might sound good in theory, but what about in practice? You know, as, as Mike Tyson likes to say, a plan is uh, only as good as until you're punched in the face. So. What are the, the things that can happen <clears throat> in the midst of sanctions and position that make it very difficult to be able to continue going forward with it? I described three major problems with the implementation of sanctions that need to be uh, dealt with. The first is underreach, the second is overreach, and the third are unintended consequences. Underreach is pretty simple. You do too little, so sanctions fail. You attempt to mount a sanction strategy, but you don't put enough energy and resources into it, and so ultimately you don't see any change in policy, any change in behavior, and in the meantime, the international community has moved on. Under each, you can imagine, is the default state of most sanctions programs, until they actually do start to show some degree of returns. But still, it is something you need to build in as a possible area of concern as you're setting out to impose sanctions. Second, overreach. And that's not just simply using too much sanctions, making too much pressure applied to the target in question, um, and such that you go overboard, but, but it's a different level of problem. It's a problem where you use sanctions to the point where your target actually sees no value in making concessions, where you present a situation to the sanctions target where they say, in effect, there is not much that we think that we can do that's ever gonna get the pressure off, and so there's no point in even trying. <coughs> As for unintended consequences, it can range from really anything, from humanitarian problems, which are probably the most well-known, especially from the Iraq example of the 1990s, to more obscure problems. And I think here we've got the biggest risk with regard to U.S. sanctions in the future. Damage being done to the U.S. economy, as well as to the perception of the U.S. economy internationally, such that uh, we lose the ability both to use our economy internationally for uh, purposes of statecraft, to be able to use sanctions, at the end of the day, even risk the degree uh, to which our economy is seen as attractive and open for business to come and uh, to, to participate in it. And so from this perspective, there is a risk of sanctions overuse, which I've written about here in the center, uh, but which uh, a number of other sanctions practices have also started to talk about. And of course, there's also an unintended consequence of doing damage to the interests of our allies and our partners, hurting them at vulnerable times. There are many times during the Iran sanctions uh, file where we started applying pressure on the Iranians, uh, not fully realizing how much uh, risk and consequence and damage it potentially could do to our allies and partners, including in Europe, in the midst of a major recession. And so one of the consequences, or rather unintended consequences of sanctions, can be actually undermining your broader sort of strategic uh, uh, framework and strategic needs. And it's something that needs to be guarded against. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is reach a Goldilocks moment in which you impose just enough pressure, just enough pain, such that you overcome the resolve of your target. And identifying that moment 
may be the most complicated aspect of the analysis that you need to undertake. But I am confident that if sanctions are framed up with a very clear sense of objectives, if they have clear benchmarks established to them to be able to identify when we have crossed certain psychological as well as uh, uh, more material thresholds, that sanctions can be designed in a way that applies maximum uh, effort, maximum effect, with the minimum amount of pain, the minimum amount of complication, both for the United States, for other sanctions uh, imposers, as well as for the target itself. I think I'll stop there. Well, thanks very much indeed. That, that was fascinating. That's a fantastic kind of um, exposition of the intellectual framework, as you say, when you're, you're thinking about sanctions. And I must say, really kind of uh, a revelation to me reading it and hearing you talk about it to kind of think about some of those basic principles. I did also, though, want to get down to a few specifics. I mean, you were very uh, directly involved, really, you know, right at the heart of the Iran sanctions effort, which you describe. I mean, I think you have a, a good point about um, it's simplistic, simplistic uh, and kind of reductive to think about sanctions as working or not working. That's kind of not really the right way to think about it. But you can think about sanctions as being helpful or not helpful, and certainly contributing to successful or unsuccessful outcomes. Um, I think, I mean, I can't remember if you exactly say it in terms, but you certainly clearly imply that um, the effort against Iran was an example of su successful use of sanctions. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you think that was successful and on what terms it was successful. Yeah. I, I, I do. I do think it was successful. And I, I have to uh, confess, as I did in the book, that uh, I, I can be accused of a bit of a bias here uh, <laughs> from, from having overseen it uh, and, for. And, and then when we've, uh, when we've heard your version, I'd yeah, like well, to talk well, a bit about <laughs> some other people's versions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but look, I, I think that uh, moving in fits and starts, uh, we were able to identify. Uh, a, a theory of success that we were able to integrate into our sanctions efforts. So we identified for ourselves, uh, and this is particularly the case at the, at the beginning of the Obama administration, but I think it was also present in the latter years of the Bush administration, that we needed to resolve the nuclear issue. Um, that uh, all other things being equal, if the nuclear issue was still outstanding, we were going to have a major security issue uh, in the Middle East, and our partners would as well. And so from that perspective, we were able to start identifying um, specific sorts of benchmarks that we would want to pursue, that we wanted to have some kind of, of reasonable resolution of the, of the nuclear problem that gave us more confidence that Iran wasn't going to be able to acquire nuclear weapons, uh, and to provide reassurance to our partners and allies. And from that, you could kind of build out what are the things you need to see in that in the nuclear space, what kinds of, of nuclear steps you need to see from the Iranians, what kind of, of transparency and verification steps you would need to see. But we were also able to then to develop a, a sanction strategy uh, that used getting to a nuclear solution as its hook, that we were able to go to partners around the world and say, listen, if we don't resolve the nuclear issue, we've got a real risk of conflict. And so, yes, we know you're not comfortable with oil reductions and oil investment bans and asset freezes, um, but uh, certainly that is better than another war across the Persian Gulf, and certainly that's better in terms of, of uh, global economic conditions and, and so forth. And we were then able to start developing a, a set of, of sanctions tools that used the amount of support we had at the time. And so we weren't uh, in a position where we knew we could go all out and go after Iranian oil in one fell swoop uh, back in 2006. There just simply wasn't enough international support. But we also knew that if over time we were proven to be the more reasonable party, if we were seen as being the ones coming to the table and trying to pursue serious good faith negotiations uh, and the Iranians uh, were not, that we'd be able to, to garner more international support and apply more pressure. And that's what we did. And so you get to a situation in 2013 where the Iranian economy was largely on the rocks. Uh, I, I don't think it was in a position where it was about to collapse anytime soon, as, as some folks have alleged. Um, but, but certainly they were in a position where they were willing to come to the table and to uh, uh, make a, a good faith offer of negotiations. And we were in a position to, to uh, make good on that ourselves and to offer them the kind of sanctions relief that they need in order to, to get to a final agreement. And so when you talk about building agreement internationally, it was critical, what, to get the Europeans and China and India 
and Japan, I mean, and Korea, who did you really need to make that, that work, that coalition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this is part of the, the main element of, of knowing the country in question and knowing your target, you know, having to understand what their vulnerabilities are. And so we identified early on that the U.S. was no longer a key vulnerability for Iran because we had been essentially out of the Iranian market since the mid-1990s, but that uh, Europe and, and Asia were key markets uh, for the Iranians less that Iran was a key market for those partners, which was an important element, that, it, that the Iranians were more dependent on international trade and international access than those uh, countries were on Iran. And, and to be absolutely clear, when we talk about international trade, that means oil, right? Which is 80% of the Iranian economy, something like that. It, it's oil, but it's not entirely oil. I mean, I think that, that's obviously the most important for, for the Iranians. But, but, but for them, it wasn't just about oil. It was also about their ability to uh, diversify their economy. You know, we started targeting, for instance, automobiles uh, in, uh, in Iran in, in June of 2013 uh, to be able to go after other aspects of their, their uh, national industry and to go after things like uh, uh, um, uh, unemployment. You know, to try and help drive that up and, and make things a little bit more sticky. Right, sure. Um, okay, so not all, all oil, though, but oil was clearly very important. And when you talk about unintended consequences being one of the things you have to think about all the time, potential damage to the U.S. and to the world economy, obviously taking a whole lot of Iranian oil off the market um, could have had the effect of sending the price right up, both kind of blunting the impact of... Uh, any harm you might be uh, trying to do to the Iranian economy and also damaging the economies of every other oil-consuming country in the world at the same time. Um, you happened to be coinciding with the shale oil boom really kind of starting to get underway. You had that great bit of good fortune fall into your lap. Do you think the whole policy, the whole strategy only worked because of shale oil? <laughs> um so I got in trouble once uh, at the NSC because I told a reporter that I thought we were lucky as well as good. So I, I, I guess I'll, I'll remake that mistake here. Uh, l l look, I mean, yes, th there is some element of uh, uh, having happenstance work to our advantage, where in fact, you know, we did have a, a lot of the oil that was coming onto the market. I'll say though, we didn't know that at the time. Uh, at least we didn't have a sophisticated understanding at the time. The, in fact, we were commissioning a lot of analyses from the Treasury and Energy Departments to say, how much do you think we're going to sky the price of oil if we start taking a lot of Iranian oil off the market? Uh, and, and the numbers were not very comforting, <laughs> which is why one of the things that we did, in fact, to mitigate this unintended consequence of, of crashing the global oil market was to build into legislation that was coming through uh, a, 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 a essentially uh, an off switch where if the president didn't uh, determine on a 180 day basis that there's enough oil in the market to be able to support sanctions, uh, that the sanctions would be turned off. So, you know, I, I think we had the right policy tools in place that could have calibrated against those unintended consequences. They were designed into the sanctions to deal with that as a problem, which is part of the reason why I say we got more sophisticated as we went. Um, but in the end, we didn't actually have to trigger that because there was uh, enough oil coming in from the United States. I mean, uh, again, so you're, you're talking about it as a success. I all know there are some people that don't share that view. Um, I think I'm right in uh, thinking that President Trump has suggested it was the worst deal ever. Was, it, was that one or one of the worst deals ever? <laughs> one of the one, worst. Among yeah. the worst deals ever. Um, and as again, you uh, specify very uh, clearly and openly in the book, there's a lot of other reasons to be concerned about Iran apart from its not nuclear program, its activities in, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, human rights record, and so on. Um, you know, put yourself back in the State Department. You're there. Um, Rex Tillerson comes to you and says, look, Richard, it's like this. President Trump's got a very clear set of concerns still about Iran. We want to do something about it now. Uh, what would you say to him now? Well, I'd, I'd start off by saying, you know, let, let's step back and think about what we have in place right now. Um, it, it, the misnomer of the nuclear agreement is that it took away all the sanctions that are against Iran. That's simply not true. And in fact, uh, if you're an Iranian banker, you might think that the sanctions that we left in place were uh, as noxious as the ones that we took off. Because still, the U.S. has retained the ability to impose sanctions against foreign banks that do business uh, with Iranian banks that we find are involved in acts of terrorism, proliferation, et cetera. And that's led to a broad chilling effect uh, with, with respect to Iran's ability to, to reintegrate into the global economy. And so I'd first say, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, you have to understand we've actually got a lot in place. And I think that if you want to put real pressure on the Iranians, uh, one way to do that would be to use what is in fact in place. Um, 
and that starts with having real conversations in Europe or conversations in Asia about the scrutiny that they are applying to transactions involving Iran to make sure that, in fact, they aren't tripping over these kinds of, of areas. But the second thing I would say is, but let's, let's also remember here that this is a long game and that the kinds of policies that Iran is still engaged in that we find so objectionable, um, you know, they, they've been doing these things for a number of years. The missile program started in the late 80s. Terrorism support started in the early 80s. Uh, you know, this, this is not something that came up overnight. And so what we really need to be focused on is a much longer set of policy changes in the country. And the, the question that I would put to him is, do you honestly think that by trying to isolate the country more, we're likely to make changes to its sense of its security dilemma, the reason why they need ballistic missiles, its sense of the region, the reason why they support terrorism, and its violation of human rights? Or is there a way of instead changing the system through uh, engagement and through showing, in fact, that, that peaceful interaction with the rest of the world is a, is a viable approach? And I think this is, to me, the biggest problem with the approach that we're taking now, is we're actually uh, giving a green light to all those in Iran who don't believe that there is a way in which they can work with the uh, outside world to solve their problems. Indeed, and I want to throw it open to the, to the rest of the panel in just a moment, but just final thought on that, which is, uh, again, when you, you discuss some of the other cases, you talk about Iraq under Saddam, you talk about North Korea today. Um, one of the conclusions one might draw is that um, uh, sanctions only work against more open and less authoritarian societies. But as you say, um, if you think about Iraq as an example of a, of a failed um, approach with sanctions, and certainly uh, North Korea as well, one of the reasons why those approaches failed is because the leaders don't care at all about what happens to the people. So you can inflict an enormous amount of pain on the country, none of which is actually felt by the leader, or very little is felt by the, by the leader and the leaders of the regime. So they don't really care, and, and they're hard to, to budge. Whereas in Iran, there are democratic mechanisms, even if they're you know, within constrained, limit, constrained limits under uh, the supreme leader and so on, but at least there's some sense that there's a play of different political forces at work. Um, the uh, government does, to an extent, have to worry about what the people think. And maybe that's why you're more likely to be able to have some successes against, against Iran than you were against some of these other countries. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think the only reason why I would push back slightly on that is uh, I, I fear that the number of cases that we have of, uh, of, of bad states, let's say, you know, if you're North Korea's and you're Iraq's, um, we, we simply have more of them against whom we wish to apply pressure for the various things they're doing. So there is to some extent a bit of a confirmation bias that comes into this, that if you're only imposing sanctions or seeking to impose sanctions against the really hard targets, then uh, to some extent you, you buy into the theory that uh, it's harder to, to, to use sanctions against them if, if they don't have uh, you know, huge success. And that's especially the case when some of the things that we are seeking to impose, uh, uh, you know, pressure on those countries to, to resolve are deeply uh, embedded parts of, of their national resolve. Take, take North Korea as your example. I, I remain pretty confident that the reason why the uh, Kim government wants to have nuclear weapons is because they are afraid of the possibility of being toppled. Mm. And uh, to some extent, uh, uh, regime rattling sanctions and threats of violence uh, only serve to uh, reinforce all the instincts of the Kim family and, and the current uh, leader to double down and retain those kinds of, of, of options. And the same thing can happen with respect to sanctions as well. So, you know, I think we, we need to be a little bit careful uh, when we, we think about uh, the kinds of targets we uh, think we could have success with with sanctions and not uh, conflate them with the targets that we tend to impose sanctions on because they're the ones doing uh, the most harm and the most damage. Thank you. Um, Jacqueline Shaw, I wonder if I can bring you in now. I'm interested in, in general on your thoughts on what you've been hearing. I mean, when you think about sanctions and sort of the success or failure of a san sanctions regime, uh, how do you think about it? And what, what do you think are the, the criteria for making a sanctions regime effective? So, so I come at this discussion from a couple of perspectives. Um, I started my career in government ages ago working on the Iraq sanctions uh, regime, the, the WMD program, which I was, I was really happy to read in the book the contrast that you set up between that, the, the, the sanctions that were put in place against Iraq in the early 1990s as compared to the Iran sanctions regime today. And I think the point you made about it was that there was no place to go up once we realized the sanctions weren't having their intended effect. So I, I think that the lessons that policymakers have taken from, from Iraq have, 
you know, reflected positively in the Iran experience. The other perspective that I, I sort of bring to this discussion as someone who's uh, working in a financial institution, and I should have prefaced this set of remarks by saying that I'm speaking in my personal capacity and my, my remarks, my thoughts are my own. Um, uh, so financial institutions, I think, which for better or for worse are really the tip of the spear for the sanctions that uh, policymakers are dreaming up in Washington, um, really are faced with a very different set of challenges. And, and I think, I think it, would be, it would be great if uh, policymakers had to spend a little bit of time in a bank to understand how these sanctions that are being developed actually have to be operationalized and implemented. And if you look at the range of sanctions we have today, the Iran sanctions are one example, the Venezuela sanctions, the Russia sanctions, these are vastly more complicated sanctions programs than I, I think were ever anticipated. And, 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 and these, these pose, they have real world consequences in terms of, uh, you mentioned um, disadvantage, uh, sort of having a disadvantaged economic environment in the United States. I think a really interesting PhD kind of research project would be to look at uh, whether there is um, flight from the dollar mm. as a consequence of, of U.S. sanctions. And um, I, I think it's also important for everyone to remember that the U.S. really leads the way internationally with sanctions. Uh, there are European Union sanctions, there are other national sanctions um, programs, other Australia, the ROK, Canada, they all have their sanctions programs. But because of the uh, primacy of the dollar in, in, in um, international banking, the U.S. really leads the way, and we have real-life consequences if you violate sanctions with fines and other types of enforcement actions. So, so I just, that's maybe, uh, we covered a lot of territory there, but I think that's the perspective that I think I wanted to try to bring to this discussion, sort of how the sanctions are operationalized. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. And as you say, um, you know, the U.S. is in quite a unique position, really, in, a, in being able to use this economic weapon. As you say, banks are facing the choice they could do business in Iran or do business in the US. It's a reasonably easy decision for it's most of them right. which way they're going to jump. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but I mean, to pick up on a, a point you made, as you say, that the, um, uh, uh, the complexity, the administrative complexity, particularly as sort of sanctions regimes, different sanction re regimes for different countries pile up. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that could be done within the constraints of the policy, do you think, to improve that and to, and to kind of lessen the burden of those things, that there must be, governments have objectives they want to achieve, the US has objectives it wants to achieve, right. um, uh, businesses want to be able to do whatever they can without breaking the law and, and going to jail. Um, is there a way of satisfying those two sets of objectives in a better way than we are doing at the moment, do you think? as you say, without, without kind of multiplying the, right. the complexity and the difficulty of administration. Right. So the way the sanctions regime has, has evolved, the way it's constructed today, I think it would be hard to sort of find, what, you know, where's the off switch mm. unless you want to... So, for example, even when a sanctions program ends, for example, uh, the Sudan sanctions program has largely ended, banks don't flip a switch and turn off those sanctions. They might, months after uh, the sanctions program has ended, there will be... Um, anguished discussions about can we remove these, uh, these uh, location tags from our screening filters? Is, what are the consequences of it? Of it? What, what are the risks? What are the reputational risks? But no one wants to be first to jump in the pool um, when the sanctions program ends. Uh, in, in the case of Sudan, the U.S. has taken off the sanctions, but Sudan is still listed as a state sponsor of terrorism. So what's a bank to do? No one, no one wants to be the first one to say. Now, now I should say there are some, some banks that are jumping back in to, to Sudan, and you know, there are all kinds of development um, reasons for that. And, and, uh, but, um, I'm, but, but, that's, but the larger point is Burma, Myanmar, another example. Um, the, the, the Burmese sanction program ended, but guess what? There are still a number of Burmese nationals that continue to be listed by OFAC, the Treasury Department, as uh, drug kingpins or uh, so. So it becomes it becomes very so a risk averse financial institution is going to have a very hard time responding to when a government decides to flip the switch. And, and at times when we might actually be wanting to encourage private sector investment into, into a country if we think now that... And Iran that, is a perfect example yeah. of that. 
um, the, the, the European Union has tried to give the green light to its banks, and European banks have said, for the most part, with some exceptions, thanks, but no thanks. We're waiting this out for a little right. while longer. Sure. You, yeah, but you. yeah and I, I very much agree with all that, and I think it, it points to one kind of major element that the government can, can generally do, which is uh, more and more clear guidance. Um, one of the things that uh, struck me when I was in government was the degree to which we thought things that we said uh, was self-executing. You know, we, we told people that there's no more uh, you know, asset freeze on this guy, and so that should just, that, that's it. We don't have to do anything more. We, we told you. Um, but the degree to which um, there is a hangover from sanctions and the degree to which there are lingering issues that we don't even uh, know about inside government um, is, is quite significant. And I, I think that additional guidance, more clear guidance, especially taking uh, uh, you know, cues from the uh, private sector as to what they need guidance on, um, is, is an important first step. And I think one of the things the Treasury Department's tried to do is to put a lot of uh, frequently asked questions out there. Um, even they could use a little bit of English 101 uh, to, to make them a little bit more transparent. Um, but, but I think uh, by fits and starts, we're getting a little bit better guidance and a little bit more clarity as to what's intended. I think we need to do more of that. And we especially need uh, sanctions uh, imposition to come with a, a mandate inside the government. If you're going to impose these things, you have a requirement to provide at least one page of what they mean, what they're going to do, and how they're going to be executed. Um, and then uh, especially the case when you're taking them off. Although even then, sometimes, um, uh, you know, the question of will the FAQ stand up in law if, the, you know, if it comes to, to legal action, so that, you know, that uh, is not necessarily enough of a reassurance. Yeah, that, that's actually always the problem. And actually, the, 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 the very clever lawyers at the Treasury Department, at the State Department as well, would say, well, the more we put in FAQs, the more we make this difficult if we have to go to court. Yeah. But, you know, to me, that, and that's, that's a valid reason. It's a valid reason to be careful. But um, to me, if you think about the way in which we handle other regulatory matters inside the United States in particular, let's just take that as an example. But, but you can even say the same thing within the EU and other places. We, we get down to definitions that are very, very specific about what is intended. We've got long review procedures where we've got uh, you know periods of comment and then final rules with sanctions because they're a national security issue they're often seen as something you just apply um, it strikes me that you need to be a little bit more balanced than that uh, and and perhaps you know I, I'm not suggesting that we need to have a 180 day review uh, process with draft rules the way you do with normal regulations uh, in the US but uh, there may be some call for being a little bit more thoughtful uh, as you're imposing kind of big sweeping sorts of measures uh, to, to get a, uh, some advice and some views from the outside uh, about what is uh, involved in implementation. And then on the flip side, when you're taking them off, be able to be responsive and reactive when concerns are, are flagged by industry. So can I just respond mm. to that? So, yeah, yeah. so that sounds really great in, in practice, and I wish it could be that way. But the, but the challenge is that the way our sanctions are constructed, for example, if we're talking about debt and equity, in the case of Russia or Venezuela, you can't give advance notice that a set of bonds are going to be radioactive the next day. There can't be a comment period on that. Because you can imagine how the market would, would react to that, to that kind of news. So there has to be sort of a, while you're on summer vacation in, at the end of August with your family, there's a whole brand new sanctions program that's announced that has sweeping ramifications for every facet of a financial institution. That kind of has to be the way it is for a reason, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're thinking of August I'm the 25th of, of August this year. The 25th yeah. when, <laughs> when I yes. had no cell phone uh, reception at yeah. a beach well, in Martha's Vineyard. But. Uh, indeed, and because we've been talking mostly about, um, about the end of sanctions, but also I wanted to think a bit more about the beginning of sanctions, as you say, when they first come on. And I've been um, uh, looking at Venezuela quite a bit. I gather you, there was an event here on Venezuela only last night, wasn't yeah. there? Which I, did you, were you there? Not at last no, night. No, no, sadly, I wasn't able to make it myself, but it would have been interested to hear what was said. But I mean, the, anecdotally, what I hear from people talking about Venezuela is that there's still a great deal of confusion yes. about, as you say, from yes. August yes. the 25th until now, yeah. about exactly what activities are covered, you know, what you're able to do with particular individuals. Yeah. Um, uh, what maybe even what kinds of security are covered and so on and a lot of financial institutions are deciding to play it safe and so there's you know shut it all in, down right and so I mean right so explain that That's I mean right. what, what's the what's the thinking well so um, um, just to talk about Venezuela for example on August 25th um, OFAC rolled out and it was very comprehensively rolled out OFAC had FAQs they had general licenses 
permitting certain categories of activity. They had very clearly written uh, guidance about the whole thing. So really, they had, I think, tried very hard to do their job with this and, and have a successful rollout. One of the licenses that OFAC issued, and this is a license that permits certain activity, concerned bonds that would otherwise be prohibited. So the, the OFAC license listed 72 bonds that were permissible to hold and to trade. Um, what OFAC didn't tell us was, for an, a week went by about what, what was the prohibited bond? What was the, what was the bond you can, or what were the bonds or bond that you cannot hold? So banks exercise, exercise a kind of boil the ocean. Um, a, you know, what, we've got to find it, look everywhere, turn up every rock, look under every, in every account, find, make sure we're not holding any prohibited bonds. And then it turns out, well, actually, the, the prohibited bond, the radioactive bond, there's only one. And no one, it's not commercially really available. No one actually holds this bond. So you, you, you just drive yourself crazy uh, trying to make sure that you're fully in compliance and it turns out maybe that was not necessary. Right. So, so I was going to say, so maybe that is an example where the execution could have been better, where... They probably um, had a reason I mean, uh, for not being able to say... It, it came out later in an FAQ after we had already figured it out. But uh, yes, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they had a reason for it. Yeah. And, and sorry, Tim, I want to bring you in a, in a moment. As the, as the other um, European on the panel, I guess I, I count as a European still for whatever it is, 15 months uh, longer. Um, uh, but actually, just before I do, I wanted to, to, to just talk about another example that I've been uh, very struck by, very interested in, which is with the Russia sanctions, but sanctioned individuals and all the business about um, Igor Sechin um, and um, Bob Dudley. So Bob Dudley, you know, chief executive, I mean, you follow the story, so but chief executive of BP is on the board of Rosneft where uh, Sechin is the chairman. And so they have been having meetings and discussing things to do with Rosneft. And Sechin is a sanctioned individual under the terms of the US sanctions, and he's somebody with whom you're not supposed to do business. But BP has been arguing, I think, that's fine for Bob Bud Dudley to do this because he wasn't talking to Sechin in his personal capacity as someone who's a sanctioned individual, but in his kind of official capacity as someone dealing with the affairs of Rosneft, the company. I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, sorry, you're shaking your head. You're, yes, yeah, yes. Huh? Well, I, I, I follow that very closely yeah. because, of course, Payday Vesa, the Venezuelan state-owned energy company, was sort of the, ca it's the so the Igor Sechin, Rosneft is the cautionary tale for how to handle the Payday Vesa, which right. also has an OFAC-designated senior official um, in Yes, in although Payday not Vesa. the chief executive of Payday No, Vesa, but it's like no, the chief but, financial yeah, officer yeah. equivalent or something like that. So um, this, this distinction that Exxon tried to draw between being designated in your personal versus your official capacity. So do you mean Exxon or do you mean BP? BP? Exxon have tried Ex it as well. Well, so, so there's an additional issue here, which okay. is that uh, okay. Exxon managed to get itself fined $2 million for uh, signing a number of documents with Igor Sechin, even though they thought that they had had a different kind of... Uh, right, uh, right. Oh, right, yeah, right. that's right. And yes, so that was sorry. The, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry. the Exxon. Yeah, yeah. The Exxon so, so, but, but, but it's been an issue with both. So, it, so Exxon right. got caught and were fined, fined. right, and right. had to pay up. Right. I, so, mean, that, so that, I mean, that sure seems like a classic example then of horrible confusion. I think it surprised people who, yeah. follow X, who follow OFAC issues that... Exxon's attorneys would make that argument because I don't now I'm sure they had reason to make the argument that they made but I, I and I know that they're appealing the decision right. but it would surprise me to be able to find uh, a theory of the case that what once you're oh, once you're designated by OFAC you cease to have an economic existence there's no bifurcation, really, of the public versus the private. The, the, way, the way OFAC officers, the sort of the gospel of OFAC, is, is read and understood right. by OFAC compliance officers. So this, this duality of uh, Igor Sechin in his personal versus professional capacity, that, that's a novel interpretation. Right. But, but that does seem to be an example, and sorry, Tim, this is where I do, do want to bring you in, which is on the question of um, European uh, a, a lack of harmony and alignment between the way European 
and uh, US governments think about things. And I know there's a, there's a particular case which has kind of exercised Exxon where they have a block in the Black Sea, I think it is, where they're not going to be allowed to drill because it's mm, affected by US sanctions. And I think I'm right in saying is that any of Italy has a block which is literally adjacent, it's absolutely next door, and they are going to be allowed to drill there. The Italian government said, yeah, it's, it's fine, mm -hmm. even though you know, US and European sanctions are uh, ostensibly aligned here. Um, but the, um, although the formal sanctions are aligned, the implementation and mm. kind of allowances for different um, uh, exceptions to be made to those rules is left to the level of the national government. So the Italian government basically has said, yeah, this is fine in a way the US government has not done. Um, I mean, how do you see then, that, you know, with, with different kind of national approaches and different um, approaches uh, in particular on some of these kind of big global issues mm. um, is, and again, we might, I guess we may very well see this in Iran as well, right? I mean, right. If, depending on what the US administration yeah. decides to do, you know, y the Europe may well not go along with them. Um, does this mean that there's a kind of, um, you know, real lack of, um, you know, in, in, what's the word I'm looking for, a real inhibitor to the US's power and authority here, which if they can't get the rest of the world to go along with them, in particular, if they can't get Europe to go along with them, they're going to be much less effective in trying to achieve the objectives they want to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, first, congratulations uh, to Richard. Uh, I just, I just, I just want to, I bought the book this afternoon on Amazon. <laughs> a bunch of places where you can, I would urge you to do that. Uh, I think I'm confident it's going to be a great read. Um, uh, look, I, I, I think that there, I think that there's, well, so here's my view as a European living in the U.S. for about six years now is that there's, from the onset, I think when these discussions, particularly related to Russian sanctions, started um, in the spring of 2014, there was a lot of skepticism that, um, uh, that Europeans were going to align themselves in any capacity uh, just because of you know, people making arguments and saying, hey, look, who's going to foot the bill for this? Um, and all those Europeans can never get their act together because they have 28 different opinions, 27. Um, and this is all very problematic. And I think it turned out differently. Uh, I actually think in retrospect that uh, we can observe that the Europeans have been uh, willing and able uh, to do a lot more than if you had asked people at the time, what do you think they're going to commit to? I think they've done a lot more than most people, if not all, would have suggested. Now, could they have done more? Yes, obviously, you always can do more. Uh, and were, were the sanctions crafted in a way that uh, you know, didn't uh, in a way that they didn't uh, inflict most uh, uh, enormous damage on the European economy. Yes, they did, and and I would say for good reason. Uh, right, it's understandable. Uh, so I think there's always a balance there. Um, uh, I'd say that the Europeans uh, and I. So I think that the downside of this, and you want to build a big coalition because you have a larger chance of success. Uh, it seems pretty obvious to me. And the downside of that is that uh, the some of the people that are willing to put. Uh, countries that are willing to put uh, you know, the least amount on the table are going to set the bar, if you will, for the amount of for the ambition level, if you will, where you where you might want to get it. So inevitably, that's um, uh, that's then going to lower maybe what you would like to do if you're sitting in Washington D.C. Um, if you're European and you look at that, you hear those arguments, you would add to that. Well, look, sure, but it's also easier to make that case if the if the actual day-to-day -day costs of this is going to be borne by by Europe uh, and, and, and not by and not and not in the United States, right? So there's a there's a trade-off there. You want to build coalitions, and so I think it's important to keep 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 uh, allies uh, close to you and, and reach a collective agreement rather than doing this unilaterally. And, and when you think about um, uh, costs to Europe and costs to the European economy, I mean. What are those? I mean, are you thinking specifically about energy? And I mean, is it about gas and, and maybe even oil, or what, what are the what are no, the issues? No, not necessarily. Not uh, necessarily. I think that uh, I think that the most of the costs that we've seen today, I mean, the sanctions, as well as my, my, my colleagues here know much better than I, were crafted in the way that the most uh, 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 the most sensitive areas in the energy sphere were spared. Right. So the sanctions were crafted in a way that were talking about investments in, in long-term uh, upstream investments in Russia, right? Think Arctic, right. think shale oil, and so those types of, uh, so, so no imminent uh, costs there, uh, carefully crafted in a way to not to circumvent the gas sector at yeah. the request of the Europeans uh, for, for evident reasons. No, uh, I'm thinking about, so in response to the, those initial sanctions, uh, the, the logical, the logical uh, uh, next thing is that you get counter sections, uh, right? And so sectors other than the energy sector have been targeted, uh, like agricultural products, uh, those types of trade, uh, uh, and there are many more examples. So if you're, 
a, a small, medium-sized uh, entrepreneur in, you know, close to, close to Russia, you're in northern Finland, you're in Poland, you're in Slovakia, um, if you grow apples there or meat products, and you trade, th that's where you actually feel the consequences on a day-to-day -day basis. And so those are the costs that, that I would talk about uh, that, you know, that are not insignificant, obviously, and, uh, um, and, and for reasons of sheer geography, it is understandable that the economic consequences of, uh, of, of these types of sanctions for Europe uh, in, in, in economic terms are more significant than they are for the U.S. Uh, right, so, so it, it is as simple as that, the ge geographic proximity and the, and the general yeah. uh, interconnectedness, interrelationships between yeah. the economies are, yeah. are, are just tighter than they are with the U.S. So, sorry, you were going to... Yeah, just, just one... Uh, point to, to put on the table with regard to this is, is it, it speaks to the issue of resolve when we're talking about sanctioned you know, targets. I mean, one of the things that sanctioned targets can do is they can you know, react themselves and they can try and split the coalitions that they're facing. And I think what's interesting to me is when I look at what the Russians did, to some extent it was intending to put pressure on the more weak and vulnerable uh, aspects of the EU to try and break consensus. Because the structure of those EU sanctions was built on a need for consensus renewal every uh, six months. Now, thus far, the EU has not done that. The EU is, is held remarkably firm, uh, and, and there's been a lot of talk about them splitting, but they have yet to do so. And that, I think, speaks to the fact that there was a careful and thoughtful process to, to develop those sanctions in the first place. But, but to me, this, this speaks to a much broader point that I wanted to make uh, at some point this evening, which is the complexity of the sanctions that we have uh, thus far. Part of the reason why they are getting much more complicated is because uh, back in the bad old days where we did simple sanctions that were easy for banks to implement, they were easy for energy companies to implement, um, we, we also had, you know, thou shalt not do business with Iraq and, and, and all the complications and difficulties that come with that. Part of the reason why we have got much more complicated, much more difficult to implement sanctions now is because of this effort to try and uh, and, and work around uh, the interests of various different groups, whether or not they are European energy consumers, whether or not they are uh, 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 you know folks working in, in banking sectors, uh, whether or not they are uh, uh, the people on the ground in the country in question. But it's in that uh, desire to build in uh, cutouts and caveats and, and safeguards that the complexity comes in. We, we could have very simple, very easy to implement sanctions and very simple and very easy to remove sanctions if we wanted to. But I think what we found uh, historically is that we don't want to do that because of all the other uh, the consequences that can come from it. I, I was going to say, I mean, is there actually evidence that the, the more complicated sanctions are more effective than the, the simpler kind? Well, I, I think you could say the jury's a little bit out, but but I think uh, that's only because we haven't had too many examples of the more sophisticated sanctions. I mean, we, we've only really been doing them for the last 10 years or, or so. I would argue that uh, the differences uh, in the damage done to the uh, uh, the population of Iraq versus Iran, uh, to me, are, are, are case in point. We were much more careful and thoughtful about humanitarian exemptions and building in uh, checks against the power of what our sanctions could do in the case of Iran. We, we didn't do that in the case of Iraq, and, and we bore the consequences of that. I think you can make a similar argument with respect to uh, Russia sanctions, um, although there the, the prevention of unintended consequences was as much for the Russian population and, and Russian uh, 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 you know, popular interests as it was for Europe and, and for our own interests as well. So. Um, this goes to a, a broader question of, you know, do, do, do sanctions in fact work, right? And, and I think at the end of the day, uh, to me, I think we're, we're all still floating around this fundamental problem of setting objectives. And whether or not we have got a crystal clear sense of what our objectives are with these uh, different regimes, whether or not we've thought through what it would take to have them removed, to me, we still haven't solved a lot of those problems with these new sanctions regimes and new sanctions concepts that we've come up with. Can, Thanks. Can just, uh, yeah. Sure. Um, build on this just a little bit. If you if you look at multilateral versus bilateral sanctions regimes, hmm. and, and 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 choose that as a metric, a measure of success. I mean, one. I think there's a very clear case that the that the unilateral, I should have said, Cuba embargo, not a screaming success. Uh, the very multilateral Iran sanctions, I think, a very different kind of outcome yeah. through negotiated diplomatic. Well, I, okay, well, let's think about Iraq for a little bit, because I, I wanted to, to get your, your thoughts on that, which were, I mean, those sanctions were pretty multilateral, right? I mean, there was a, you know, right. it was a but reasonable... But not sustainable clip. over the long term. Uh, right. Well, that may be part of the answer then. But, I mean, one of the things I just wanted to question was, I mean, I think you, you described them as unsuccessful, is that 
definitely our conclusion about the Iraq sanctions. I mean, you know, and again, perhaps it comes back to your point about defining what success is. I mean, as you say, there clearly was a, a, a terrible humanitarian cost, but Saddam Hussein uh, was not expansionist at all during that period, right. and he did not develop a WMD program. You know, both of those things, um, which might have been, which, I mean, were clearly part of the of the objective of the sanctions. Um, that those objectives were actually achieved. So, I, I mean, I'm interested in everyone's thoughts on that, but I, I mean, Richard, you Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that may be one of the more controversial conclusions I reach in this book, which is that those sanctions were, in fact, successful. If you measure them by the, the metrics uh, that we started off with, which were contain uh, uh, expansionist Iraq and prevent uh, reconstitution of the WMD uh, and missile programs, and we, we found to our chagrin in 2003 that uh, we were much more successful on the latter than we thought. Um, the problem is that we did not have a consensus view of, of that success uh, in the international community uh, and, and certainly across the Atlantic. And um, we, we did not recognize uh, for a number of reasons that uh, what was happening in Iraq was, was not what we actually thought was happening in Iraq with regard to WMD. And, yeah, and I'm sorry to be clear about that. When you say you didn't have a consensus view across the Atlantic, what, what was the crucial divergence then? In, in what ways did... Europe and the U.S. disagree. Well, we first didn't, you didn't have a consensus view about whether or not Iraq had reconstituted a WMD program. So that that you know that's a fundamental intelligence failure that we need to deal with separately. But we also didn't have a view of what would be a satisfactory outcome to this episode. Would would it be satisfactory to have Saddam Hussein remaining in power in Iraq uh, under a diplomatic settlement that then hems in all those capabilities in perpetuity? Um, instead, the 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 push was uh, you know to to push for regime change out of the United States and the UK. And I think that was based on, uh, on a misguided understanding of the intelligence, sure. It was misguided sense of the risks uh, still posed by Saddam Hussein. But to me, even more fundamentally, it was a breakdown in our common view internationally about why we did this and what we were intending to achieve as a result of all this. And the fact that uh, people were saying in 2000, well, Saddam Hussein is still uh, in charge in Iraq, but that's not why we started all this. Yeah. Jacqueline, yeah, you're, I, just, you're I just want, I love, by the way, relitigating the whole Iraq WMD file is my favorite. <laughs> um, but no, but, but seriously, I think that you, you mentioned that Iraq had no WMD and that's a consequence of sanctions. Mm. And I would take issue with that because the, the absence of the reconstituted for the WMD program, the credit for that, I believe, goes to the international inspection monitoring verification regime right. that was put in place by the sanctions resolutions, mm -hmm. which the, the, the operationalizing that um, it, is that a excessively subtle distinction? Why, why no, is that distinction that, important? I mean, because the, the, the sanctions shut down Iraq as an economic entity mm. in markets, yeah. with, with the exception of the humanitarian goods mm. and oil for food, whatever you want to make of that. The the um, UNSCOM and then its successor it was called UNMOVIC, the monitoring verification regime. They were the the, the people trying to get the ground truth and maintaining international supervision, monitoring, verification. The IAEA was there. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my argument would be, if you read the fine print of the work that they were doing, they really do deserve the credit right. for I mean, yeah. ensuring that these programs were not reconstituted. Well, a bit. As I mean, imperfect it, as they may be. Yeah. I mean, I'll push back on that only a, a, a little bit. I mean, part, part of the reason why they were successful is there was a broader uh, infrastructure that was denying Iraq the ability, yes, even if yes, it chose true. not to yes, do so, yes. to even be able to get those yes. goods back in. Yes. And and I think we would broadly define those as being sanctions yeah. too. Okay, fine. But. And, and so, the, I mean, on that aside, the WMD issue to one side, um, uh, so, so Jack, I just wanted to get. I mean, your, your thoughts. I mean, just in terms of your sense of the uh, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of that of that sanctions regime. I mean, did you think that? Um, would you agree that, in hindsight, it was? I, I think Richard's point about about lack of consensus internationally about what our objectives are, how we're going about it. I'm, my my view is that consensus had started to break down. There was there, we were not the U.S. was not going to be able to persuade its European partners that the continued comprehensive incredibly tight, overwhelming sanctions, that that was going to be sustainable. They, you know, the imagery, the humanitarian consequences of the sanctions, that, that, you know, all of that was, un it was unraveling. And it was very clear it was not sustainable. Tim, your thoughts? Yeah, can I, I'll, um, uh, I mean, at the, I, I think another example of why, of, of how important it is to have uh, a, a multi, multi-lateral approach to these, 
uh, types of efforts is that uh, we find in the Russia sanctions today, right? So we talked about the sort of collective effort, and we can talk about all the flaws in there and how strong or weak they are, and that, fine. Um, but um, uh, earlier this year, uh, as you all know, um, uh, urged by you know, uh, uh, by both the uh, the House and uh, and the Senate, um, the White House was given another tool that was in Europe widely perceived, as you know, as oh, these are unilateral sanctions that are now being installed. Yeah. Uh, which I think I think undermines some of the earlier efforts that had had been I, I would say relatively successful, um, and, and it undermined because the very easy argument uh, that was made repeatedly in Europe was, hey, look, uh, this is a a very easy to spot attempt of the U.S. government to promote U.S. natural gas sales in Europe. This market is glutted, uh, and the American companies have no place to sell this stuff, and therefore now they're trying to really target our gas sector uh, by you know, targeting. Uh, uh, gas export pipelines, in particular Nord Stream 2, which is controversial already, and so therefore uh, uh, this is how the Americans are trying to sell their product in Europe, uh, and we're not going to buy that and we don't support it. And so there's a lot of skepticism today uh, about these efforts. Uh, so I think, I think that illustrates how important it is to keep your partners close to you yeah. and keep informing them and having a dialogue and keeping them on board. And, and, of course, the good news is, though, that President Trump has apparently been very responsive to those concerns in Europe because he's actually declined to implement those sanctions, right? So, <laughs> so he's obviously very worried about what Brussels thinks he, about him. And, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. He, <laughs> um, he, he has been, but, but they're lingering, uh, right? And so there's still yeah. uncertainty. There's still the, uh, yeah. So I think, I think despite that uh, fact, uh, there, is, uh, there is ongoing conversation as to what will happen next, right? And, and Richard and I talked about that. Okay, what, what would be next steps if... Uh, the president continues to say, I'm not going to use this tool. Very nice of you, but thank you, I don't need it. Well, it turned out that overwhelming majority of House and Senate actually wants the president to do something. So then if he doesn't, then at some point in time, you're going to reach a, uh, a moment where that same House and Senate are going to say, well, look, Mr. President, it's nice of you, yet you're not using it, but we actually want you to do this. And yeah. we voted, what was it, 98 or 2, or whatever it yeah. was. To do, so, yeah. so, so we're going to come up with alternatives. Sort of, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in both, both of your thoughts as well about exactly this, this rather curious episode. I mean, do you have an expectation for how, how it might play out? Well, I mean, I, I, I think candidly this administration has no intention of, of uh, using the sanctions tools that was given it uh, uh, to deal with Russia. I think that that cuts against uh, the, the, the president's Russia policy and Russia policy concept. Um, and, and look, I mean, you know, being uh, reasonable here, there, there is an argument to be made that if you're going to try and have a better relationship uh, with Russia, you shouldn't start off by, you know, sanctioning a whole bunch of their companies. Yeah. But, but the flip side of that, of course, is uh, it, it would be easier to understand and accept the nature of that desire for a better relationship if there weren't these lingering questions about yeah. what was happening. I, I think that ultimately what will happen is exactly as Tim is saying. I, th I think that um, Congress is going to take this matter up again. And they are going to consider restraining some of the uh, uh, flexibility that was granted to the president in the uh, initial sets of sanctions, and they're going to make it a lot more difficult to implement. And and this is a problem from a number of respects. It's a problem in terms of European partners, a problem in terms of the market, but it's even a fundamental problem of sanction statecraft because yet again we have misunderstood objectives, misunderstood and, and confused rationale for imposition. We've got lackluster enforcement, and we don't have any clear sense of why uh, the sanctions are there and what would it take to have them go away. And so from, from that perspective, even if I personally believe that we should have some more sanctions on Russia in response to its, its various different bad acts, um, to me this still potentially fails my fundamental test, which is we don't understand why we're doing it and what it would take to get rid of them. I mean, yeah, and you raise a good point, actually, which I have to admit my ignorance here. Do, I mean, what it, the stated rationale for that latest set of sanctions and the, and the passage through Congress was what? Punishment for interference in the U.S. election? Or what was what? That, that's explicitly what was said in Congress. I mean, that was a large part of it. I mean, there was also a connection made to the current unresolved situation in Ukraine. I mean, we, we still have, you know, notwithstanding a ceasefire uh, in, in eastern Ukraine, uh, I, I think there's more uh, mortars being fired there than potentially any other place on Earth. And so from that perspective, the, the, the fact that Eastern Ukraine remains a battleground, uh, I, I think, indicates that we haven't yet uh, resolved the fundamental problems that, that led for sanctions to be imposed in the first place. Yeah, sure. So, Tim, you wanted to go in? Yeah, no, I, yeah, no I, I mean, I agree with all of that. There was a, I think there's a broader dissatisfaction in, in Washington, D.C. with regard to the role that Russia plays, right? The same. You can point to Syria and the role that Russia plays there. You can point to Afghanistan. I think that all, that all piles up. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a, there, there's a president uh, in the White House that has a, uh, 
you know, peculiar, very ill-defined, but peculiar relationship himself with with Russia. Mm-hmm. That uh, that on in, in Washington D.C. there's a lot of curiosity about to put it mildly, right? Uh, and so the people are trying to pin down, okay, what's going on here and what's this. So I think all of that adds up to a point where. Uh, there was such a such an overwhelming majority that says no. Look, actually, we want you to do more, uh, right. just regardless of what you want. We want you. To do that. But but that very kind of uh, nebulous then sense of you know we're unhappy with Russia for this this and this reason, mm-hmm. absolutely. Richard was saying right. violates his first or right. one of his key right. principles right. of sanctions, right. which is know what you're trying to achieve, have an idea of what success looks like, and yeah. then you uh, yeah. deploy a strategy to to achieve that outcome. Yeah, yeah. and it undermines what you wanted to do. I think uh, building coalitions, broad coalitions to get to a point where you want to be uh, because I think in, in terms of you know the US uh, well transatlantic cooperation on this matter that damage has been done right there's a, regardless of how strong that argument is as to whether this was used I don't think it is so whether this policy was designed to help US you know gas producers well, I don't think yeah. that's the point the point is that the damage damage be done in terms of that that, that transatlantic trust and mm-hmm. that, that you need uh, yeah. I mean, did, did you give any could you give any credence to that idea that it might be something aimed at no I mean no. I know what you think you've just made your made your views clear I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if there is anyone else well, I, w- I was just going to say the parts of the new sanctions it has this terrible acronym it's CAT, C-A-A-T-S-A elements of, of those uh, measures took effect November 28 and I can tell you that banks are implementing those sanctions with um, with uh, a great deal of you know I mean there's no hesitation those are those are those are new sanctions we go to work immediately implementing those things. Right, okay. Which parts are no, you... I mean, is that, is so that, are were, they minor parts were, or is this the main were, body of what there, was... There, that, it's a sprawling piece of legislation which, you know, there are issues with because some of it is delegated to the State Department to implement, some of it is the domain of the Treasury Department, so it's a little different from other types of big heavyweight sanctions legislation. But the aspect that was... Um, that took effect on the 28th of November has to do with debt tenors and the shortening of right. debt tenders I, and for certain designated entities it's down to 14 days so you know you can imagine that this is challenging for certain right. financial institutions because you get a transaction and uh, it hits on the entity and you you have to dig into it and figure out are we you know within the permissible um, anyway so that right. so, so I can just yeah. say yeah those sanctions are being so, even so, so if it, the administration it, is not enthusiastic about it financial institutions but, are <laughs> Right. <laughs> but I mean, that actually goes to a, a broader problem, which is uh, the, the financial institutions that have Jackie uh, r- running their, their sanctions compliance might, might be all in the clear. But, but part of the problem with enforcement and part of what you know, was the reason why sanctions were discredited in the Iraq case was this idea that there was uneven or unfair enforcement, that, that some countries were getting away with doing something, some banks are getting away with doing something. And so what, one of the big problems about having uh, an unclear sense of enforcement is that you, you raise the risk of fatigue and a sense of unfairness that can be really damaging to to keeping a sanctions uh, you know regime together and what about that point then about um, it, it's all a, a plot to help uh, Chenier energy uh, sell more gas in Europe <laughs> is that Right, it's all true. No, I, the, the, it, I very much agree with Tim um, that uh, it is highly damaging that that is the sense that is out there. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I will say that uh, anecdotally, uh, some of the most uncomfortable conversations I ever had with European uh, friends of, on Iran sanctions was uh, when I was accused of trying to create market share for the United States in seeking European sanctions. And, and one funny little story was a, a woman came and she said, you know, look, Trade with Iran between the United States and and and, uh, and Iran that, that has gone through the roof. It's doubled over the course of the last year. Uh, trade between the EU and uh, and Iran is down by a third. And I said, oh, that's that's interesting. Uh, your scales are millions for the U.S. and billions for the <laughs> EU. I think I think we got a problem here. And then I want to remind the woman that uh, that our sales were of food because there was a crop failure in Iran, and asked the question, should we stop selling the Iranians wheat? We, we got a slightly different response. But but part of the reason why the U.S. has been somewhat effective with using sanctions, especially in certain circumstances, is that we've been able to present them as a political tool divorced from our economic interest. Part of the reason why we're able to help sell the JCPOA. We have no economic interest. There is no relationship between Iran and the United States. That this is about the the, the X's and O's of of of, of the nuclear peace. Um, when you start to have the question raised, either because of poorly worded legislation or uh, conspiracy mongering, or if you have the President of the United States talking about America first and uh, ensuring all of our policies are directed at 
U.S. economic advantage, I think it makes it much more difficult uh, to sustain that same uh, uh, narrative, and it makes it much more difficult to have sanctions actually implemented. I mean, you say U.S. has no economic interest. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about Iranian markets opening up, being, you know, selling them airliners, etc. Um, but that. I mean, what you think doesn't pa pales in comparison. Pales, I mean, it, and look, I mean, at the end of the day, what the U.S. did in the Iran deal was we allowed them to buy uh, uh, civil uh, uh, aviation support, uh, and we agreed that we would uh, permit Americans to buy pistachios and rugs. Uh, that. And saffron. There we go. We got saffron in there. That, that's the limit of the U.S. Uh, direct exposure to, to Iran. And when you compare that against all the benefits that will be accruing to uh, foreign companies for doing oil and gas investments inside of Iran. Uh, I'll tell you this. When I went down to, to Houston shortly after the deal was done, the talking point was not, uh, you know, what, what's wrong with the nuclear provision? It was, gee, why couldn't you cut us into this? <laughs> right. Thank you. Now, I wanted to open it uh, out for questions. I don't know if anyone has got anything they wanted to ask. Yeah, if you could come to the, the mic, that would be great. Thanks very much. Springer. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, you've argued in the course of this presentation about, uh, about the importance of um, sanctions being applied with care uh, toward specific objectives. Um, I'd like to ask you to comment a little bit about what might lie ahead um, in the case of Iran, uh, where sanctions played such an important role. If now the United States decides to walk away from uh, the Iran deal, does that make any difference in any direction toward the future efficacy of uh, sanctions? Uh, nobody likes them in the first instance when they're applied, so maybe it doesn't make any difference, but I'd be, inter be interested in your view. Yeah, I, I think there is definitely some risk of bait and switch uh, being being seen by a lot of folks uh, in the international community. That we said for a very long time that U.S. sanctions against Iran were intended on getting a nuclear solution. We got a nuclear solution, then we decided we didn't like it. Uh, and I think uh, that is going to complicate our ability to get international partners to sign on to, to future sanctions. Now, I don't want to overstate that, right, because other situations are going to have their own context as well. Um, I don't think that if there was an imminent invasion of, of Europe uh, that they would be quibbling about whether or not we had uh, bait and switched on Iran sanctions in the past if, if sanctions were seen as a tool that could potentially be used, and, and the same thing with other situations you can imagine. Uh, but I do think that there is going to be an effect on our ability to say we had concerns, we addressed those concerns, and so therefore we took off the sanctions, and getting people to sign on to doing them uh, again in the future. And I think what's most troubling about that in the Iran case is it'll be in furtherance of a strategy that I, I'm not at all convinced is going to work. You know, as I said at, at some point in this, this presentation, the kinds of concerns we have with Iran go back 30 years. Uh, and uh, it's highly unlikely that the Iranians are going to give up ballistic missiles simply because we uh, impose some sanctions on them when we consider the fact that the Iranians consider ballistic missiles a core part of their national security in dealing with the, the threats that they face. And the same thing can be said about relationships with Hezbollah, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that the worst part of all this is we might damage our credibility internationally, we might damage our ability to work with partners, and it might not even have much of an effect uh, on, our, on our newfound objectives. Thank you. Anyone else want to? Comment on that? Or you, yeah. Right, th thanks very much. Anyone else? Yeah, there's one uh, there. Do, do, you want, do you want to come up to the front and use the mic? Uh, my name is Chrissy. Okay. Um, sorry. We can yeah, work yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
excellent questions. I mean, yeah. and, and actually, I mean, some of the, the, that point about sort of the process was highly relevant. I mean, you talk about this as it related to Iran in, in the book. But anyway, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so for, for folks who may be listening at home, the, the, the questions about uh, uh, the degree to which in a political environment we, we might uh, you know, want to uh, consider imposition of sanctions to address a political constituency at home and, and as we're approaching elections. I mean, I, I will say uh, my knee-jerk reaction is if, if the reason why you're considering imposing sanctions on someone is because you've got a political um, uh, requirement at home, uh, you need to hit reset and, and think about this again. Um, th that, unfortunately, may be the reason why sanctions are considered in a number of cases, but to me it's the exact wrong reason uh, to consider imposing sanctions and to use them. They, they should be used uh, as you would use military force, with the same degree of care, the same degree of thought, the same degree of strategy, and the same appreciation of the risks that come along with that. And we've all seen the movie Wag the Dog, where you know military actions are used in order to get a president reelected or to get him out of trouble. Uh, there's a reason why that movie was seen as being a problem, <laughs> and the reason why it's it's considered a slur uh, if you say that of a president uh, now. Um, I, I think the same thing should apply with regard to sanctions. It, to me, uh, we, we have to start over again and think about why we would be doing it in the first place. And, and as, oh, sorry, go ahead. Really yeah. quickly to add to build on that, uh, we, we've talked about the importance of multilateralizing sanctions. If, if our European partners thought that the reason sanctions were being imposed was to advance a, a U.S. domestic political agenda, they would laugh at us. And on top of that, they would probably start talking about something that's already been discussed, which in, in the EU context, which are these blocking measures. And this is, this is, we haven't talked about these yet, but, but there, you know, you, you can set up a conflict of laws situation where the U.S. unilaterally imposes a, a category of sanctions and our European partners say, we're not going along with this and we're going to undermine your ability internationally to give effect to these sanctions. And, and banks will be in a world of hurt. Our lawyers will be very happy and excited about that, <laughs> but it will be a very complicated world that we're living in. And, and just think about the, the process, Richard, you know, as I say, maybe looking back to how it worked in Iran, how much can a president act uh, unilaterally without Congress on this? And obviously, you know, President Obama did, to, to quite a large extent, uh, go without Congress. And yet then they were also saying what we've seen this year is Congress trying to act and, and maybe eventually being able to push the president into something that he might not otherwise want to do. So how, you know, how does the, uh, the separation of powers really work when it comes to sanctions? So you know, Congress has delegated uh, pretty broad authorities to the president in the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, um, which has uh, been renewed, um, uh, to basically declare a national emergency and to exercise pretty extraordinary economic authorities uh, to, to impose sanctions. Sanctions. And that's where every time you see an executive order come out that deals with uh, 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 sanctions, it's under IEPA. So th there is formal legislation that authorizes the president to act. So from a constitutional separation of powers perspective, um, it all takes place under a law that exists and an authority that was granted by, by Congress. But um, considering how uh, broadly uh, that authority has been used, everything from sanctions on Iran to uh, sanctions on cyber uh, 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 you know, criminals to terrorism to human rights, et cetera, um, the, the ability to use that authority pretty broadly to target any kind of class of bad activity or any country that presents a, a threat to the United States is, is also pretty broad. So the president has an awful lot of authority, if he wanted to do that in that, that kind of circumstance, to, to gin up a sanctions program and to, to begin executing it. Now on the flip side of that is any president that decides to exercise the National Emergency Declaration Authority capriciously. Uh, you know, I hereby have a national emergency on this person that I don't like uh, or on this country that's causing me difficulty, but it's not commonly uh, uh, accepted by by others in the U.S., um, runs the risk of having that authority rescinded by Congress. An act of Congress can also have an act of Congress to, to check it back as well. But again, um, in the, the example of the, the new set of sanctions on Russia, there is specific congressional authority for those. So if President Trump did decide at one point that 
it would be advantageous to implement that, he could just go right ahead and do that. that that's, yeah, no, in, in, in fact, I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea, is that you know, right. he, he, he ought to be doing that in, in some respects. And I think you know, Congress has got the ability to weigh back in via various different mechanisms of oversight with hearings, with additional legislation, with, with uh, statements uh, for the record that are, are presented to try and explain what their intent was with regard to those sanctions. But, but absolutely, the authorities that are in place exist to be executed. How much they're executed, how much they're enforced is a, a, a decision that gets to be made by the chief executive who is the president. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Any others? Um, anyone else? Yeah, there's a couple. There's one there at the back. Yeah, sorry, we're, we're running up. Maybe but maybe I'll take two together, if that's all right, because I think we're just about out of time. But yeah, um, do, well, yeah, well, um, up to you. If you stand up and yell or... Uh, because there's still a lot of aid coming into the country and those exceptions are in place, to what extent is it possible to achieve the objections whilst still providing that aid? I mean, to what extent does providing that humanitarian aid then undermine a leader what, placing those sanctions on a country like North Korea where it's a leader who will just take that aid to feed people and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, yeah, which was, a, um, and as, as you discussed, was a very live ash issue in, in the case of Iraq. And sorry, there was one more, you, you yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. My name is Emre Tipoğlu. I am with the Saki Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies here, and I had written my PhD years ago on sanctions. Um, how would you evaluate, you gave us a roadmap of how to design and implement successful sanctions, and how would you uh, evaluate the willingness or lack thereof of Congress uh, being involved with this progress? And I just want to give a small anecdote. I was listening to a Columbia Energy podcast, a fellow was interviewing a Russian official, and when she was asking about future prospects of a possible sanction, um, the guest uh, answered, you know, we don't think about today, we think about Jackson Vanek. No matter what the uh, administration speaks to what Sal tells us, we rather think about what happened with Jackson Vanek and mm -hmm. we evaluate sanctions from that perspective, so the perception issue there. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Two so, you. yeah, just just a, a couple of quick reactions. I think uh, first, with respect to, to Iraq and, and the lessons for North Korea, I, I don't want to give the impression that I think that you needed to have the kinds of sanctions you had against Iraq in order to have made them a success. I, I think, um, you know, as, as I hope has come out, um, there are ways in which you can be much more effective, potentially, but it's certainly as effective by using less in, in form of sanctions uh, pressure and sanctions force. And I think that ought to be the objective for everyone seeking to impose sanctions is the, the minimum necessary uh, amount of sanctions pressure ought to be applied. I don't think you need to, to uh, put at risk and, and starve 500,000 children in order to be able uh, to achieve that. And so from that perspective, I, I, I think um, uh, the, the effective use of sanctions actually requires uh, a lot more care and thought about how you're designing uh, the tools so as to avoid uh, this, this overuse uh, problem. Briefly, I'll just say, I think with regard to North Korea, the problems that we've got there are much less about the kinds of sanctions that we can impose and the degree to which the North Korean regime is inclined to make any accommodations for our concerns with regard to its nuclear weapons or its missile programs. And I think that the biggest problem we've got now is that uh, we're having a hard time realizing that uh, we may have failed on this and that we need to now change our approach and change what our objectives ought to be uh, with North Korea. Um, briefly, with respect to Congress and, and framing up sanctions, look, I, I, but the idea of the book is that uh, 535 members of Congress can read it too, and and uh, you know, ho hopefully, um, if if nothing else, it helps to to engender a real discussion about 
how to use the tool thoughtfully and carefully and methodically uh, with a sense of what you're trying to achieve and, and how to know when you've got there. Um, I, I think that um, there is always going to be a historical uh, uh, metaphor that somebody's going to be able to use. Well, you we remember Jackson Manic. This is just like Jackson Manic, or this is just like Iraq. But I think um, uh, if, if sanctions practitioners are able to demonstrate that they are being more thoughtful and careful about how they use the tool, at some point uh, the, the lessons that people uh, uh, are citing and the examples they cite will be uh, those of more successes and certainly ones where uh, more efficiency and effectiveness were involved rather than just simply uh, brute force. Well, I mean, I, to be totally blunt, I mean, I think that sanctions at this point have, have run their course with regard to North Korea. I, I think that um, we need to be approaching the North Koreans uh, from a standpoint of establishing uh, deterrence with respect to uh, their latent threats to uh, attack the United States and our interests. And I think that uh, sanctions to be able to persuade them to disarm at this point are, are probably uh, no longer achievable. Well. Sorry to be unable to uh, end on a more cheerful note. I think we have, Jason, you wanted to uh, uh, say um, Thanks you all for coming. Uh, so I'm Jason Bordoff, the director of the Center on Global Energy Policy, and I just wanna thank our panelists, uh, Jackie and Tim, and uh, thank you, Ed, one of the go-to energy reporters in the world, really, who uh, I think we all follow really closely. And uh, especially just congratulate you, Richard, on behalf of Columbia, the Center on Global Energy Policy. Thank our partners at Columbia University Press, too, for this book series. I think this book, The Art of Sanctions, is a perfect example of why we created this book series, why we do the work we do at the Energy Center every day to look at energy uh, as an environmental issue, as a geopolitical issue, as an economic issue, approach it from all of those different standpoints, uh, and try to take issues that are dominated too often by rhetoric and hyperbole and, and, uh, and really take a strong fact-based approach to understanding them with the world-class research being done at a university like Columbia and very senior practitioners from the public and private sector who step away after many years, like Richard at the State Department, to help us all understand uh, these issues better. And so this is a, uh, Richard's ex work is exemplary, I think, in this regard, and this book is a, a crowning achievement in that regard. And we will continue to pursue that, uh, that, that goal of uh, cutting through rhetoric and uh, hyperbole uh, with our next book, which we'll do this again in a few weeks, uh, The Fracking Debate, which is intended to be a dispassionate, evidence-based look at an issue that generates a lot of passion and, uh, and, and polarization. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and please join me in congratulating Richard.